Good morning. Thank you for joining us today on Sustainable Resource Management, Jose Rivera and, Water, and Robert C. on Water Justice, one of the many online talks organized by the Ateneo de Manila University Press during this year's Manila International Online Book Fair. Today, we are putting the Sustainable Community Irrigation System of Ilocos into focus as we launch the print and ebook versions of the Sanjeras of Ilocos, Cooperative Irrigation Societies of the Philippines. I am Almira Manduriao of Ateneo University Press and welcome to this morning's session. We are currently streaming live through the Ateneo University Press Facebook page and the Ateneo de Manila University YouTube channel. 
We see you all in the comments. Say hi if you're tuning with us today. Please also comment your location so that we'll know where you are coming from. Once again, this book launch is organized by the Ateneo University Press during this year's Manila International Online Book Fair. Enjoy Ateneo Press's discounts and special bundle promos and add to cart on our store at www.manilabookfair.com. Alright, looks like everyone is ready for today's book launch. Let me introduce our speakers. Mr. Robert C. is joining us this morning. Robert is a sustainable mobility advocate. He writes for the column Mobility Matters in the Manila Times and is advisor to Move as One Coalition. Robert was formerly advisor to the Department of Transportation, senior advisor to Asian Development Bank, economist in World Bank, and assistant professor at Asian Institute of Management. He completed his doctorate in city and regional planning at Cornell University. And of course, we have with us today the author of the Sanjeras of Elocus, Jose Rivera. Jose is an internationally known scholar of community irrigation systems. He is a research associate at the Center for Regional Studies, University of New Mexico, and Professor Emeritus in the School of Architecture and Planning, where he taught courses in rural development. His research interests include the study of traditional water management from a comparative perspective with a focus on governance and social organization. Fieldwork sites have included the southwestern United States, Baja California Sur in Mexico, Peru, Valencia in Mercia, Spain, and the Ilocos region of northern Luzon. Let's all welcome Robert and Jose. You know, my job today, uh, friends, Hello. good morning and uh, good evening, Jose, who's coming to us from New Mexico. Uh, good, good my morning. job is to get every get everyone here to uh, learn about Jose and his marvelous book. So maybe we'll go right into that, Jose. You know, sure. tell us about your background. Do you have any natural connections to the Philippines? And how did you first learn about the Sangheras? Gosh, uh, no, I don't have any natural connection. It, it has to do, though, with some uh, sort of similarities. Uh, you know, Ilocos, as we all know, as you know, is the one of the most northern regions of the whole uh, Philippines. And, and so here in, in the United States, uh, our uh, state of New Mexico is okay. also uh, the, uh, you know, northern uh, part of what used to be uh, Spain. So both uh, local uh, provinces in New Mexico share that kind of history as uh, colonial uh, provinces, you know, for uh, more than two centuries. So we have that as a common area. But no, I had not been to uh, the Philippines or Ilocos until I went to conduct field work. And as far as where I learned about or heard about uh, the Sanjeras, you know, the irrigation systems of the locals uh, was through the work of your professor, Walt Coward, when, you know, at Cornell University. And uh, then, of course, that was 1979, his article in the Human Organization Journal. And then your book came out just uh, three years later, 1982, Lessons from the Sanjeras. So uh, that's what really caused my attention, you know, on them because uh, I saw many parallels and similarities between the irrigation systems here and, and those in the Philippines at Ilocos. So, Jose, you know, we share that common sort of background and uh, understanding of the Sangheras. But, you see, what I see from your book is you've devoted, you know, many years of collecting, you know, amazing detail and historical information about the Sangheras. And what about them, you know, sets them apart from many of the other irrigation organizations around the world? So what about the Sangheras captured your interest and motivated you to devote a huge amount of your professional life, you know, uh, to studying how they work? Well, basically because they have endured, you know, uh, for centuries, 
uh, you know, there in the locos as, and similar to the uh, irrigation systems here, here they're called asequias, which is an Arabic word. Uh, and so the two parallels there, these are what I call in when I taught, you know, in community regional planning, you know, your field and mine as well. I tell my students that these are people's institutions. That's really what caused me to focus and uh, study the both the Sanjeros of Ilocos and the Acequias of New Mexico is that they have endured, uh, they are run uh, as a self-government. Uh, they've endured uh, several centuries and they're still here. And I was curious as to several questions, you know, what is it that they have in common and what are their differences? And going back to part of your question about the Sanjeros in particular, it was just, uh, you know, uh, fantastic what you and Walt Coward had written about them and Ruth Yabis also uh, uh, in her dissertation also at Cornell University with Walt Coward and that where you described the water for land exchanges, you know, basically uh, tenant farmers and peasant farmers that previously did not have land, they negotiated with landowners and exchanged uh, water for land, basically, they dug out the uh, the uh, canals for the Sanjera system, delivered water to all of the fields, including the landowner fields, and then their own. And so the landowner uh, gave up part of the, you know, uh, land. It, it, it been this whole bartering and negotiating back and forth. And then, of course, the ATAR that you've written a lot about, you and Walt Coward, you know, and that the uh, irrigators, the sanjeros, as they're called, you know, uh, they have these land holdings that are uh, to them, you know. So all of those things, uh, you know, is what caused me to look uh, more deeply into this. No, this is a uh, this this is the fascinating part. Uh, perhaps not not very well known in the Philippines, but like you say, these are amazing institutions that have evolved. Uh, innovative practices that have been uh, that have promoted sustainable agriculture and resource management for centuries, right? So this is really an amazing thing. Now you mentioned that you've also uh, done work in other parts of the world on similar institutions in the U.S., Mexico, Peru, and Spain. So. What did you find in common and what did that tell you about their perhaps origins? Yeah, well, a lot of it is their, their governance. You know, they uh, have a, an executive a board of one kind or another. They have officers. Uh, they have rules and regulations of how to share the water and distribute it. They have principles of equity and, uh, you know, in the distribution of water. Uh, and so they, they are. The, we, these are found... In, in many parts of the world, and in addition to the countries that, that I've been in. And so uh, that was part of my objective was to say, okay, what is it they have in common? And what is it that are the differences? And then what, what makes for those differences, you know? Uh, but in common, you know, they, they have survived in other parts of the world too. And but with the challenges, you know, of climate uh, change and uh, urbanization and loss of agricultural land and overpopulation and so forth, uh, I was curious, that's why I looked at these other countries, was, you know, how are they uh, dealing with these uh, common threats, if you will, as, as a global, you know, sort of movement. But uh, in, in trying to trace also uh, how they are evolving and how they are facing, you know, current, you know, environmental challenges, uh, did you find, you know, some common elements about their origins you know there so it's always been a question did these uh institutions evolve sort of indigenously you know through their own sort of uh you know trial and error or were there also perhaps some inputs that had come you know from imported sources yeah, it really was, is a combination. It's a, a mixture of both indigenous uh, features, certainly the, the uh, bartering and exchanging water for land. That is totally unique uh, to the Philippines. I have not found that anywhere else, you know, and so uh, the indigenous features are there. Uh, but then also there are some commonalities with the uh, acequias of 
of, of Spain in particular and, and those here in New Mexico as well. And that has to do a lot with their social organization as societies. You know, these are irrigation, uh, you know, institutions, irrigation society with an executive board and rules and regulations and uh, they monitor and compliance and uh, their their government, you know, is, is what's, uh, uh, you know, a, a big common area. And in, in the book, I conclude that the indigenous features, uh, the uh, artars and the ex uh, exchanges of uh, water for land, those are totally uh, ilocos, you know, uh, but the governance uh, is a shared uh, type of system with uh, other acequias in, in, in New Mexico and, and in Spain, because uh, when I read your book, you know, you listed out all the different rules and regulations of, of the uh, farmers and so forth. And I said, oh, my gosh, these are, you know, almost identical to the ones uh, in Spain and to the ones here in New Mexico. So I concluded uh, pretty much what Eleanor Ostrom in her book, you know, Governing the Commons, uh, she, of all the irrigation systems in the world that she could have selected for developing her principles of long enduring, you know, irrigation, she chose the Sanjeras of uh, Ilocos and she chose the Acequias of Valencia. And so, uh, you know, that was really, you know, part of what I was looking into, uh, you know, how they are similar and also how they are different. So I concluded that Ostrom was on the right track and, and so were you because you pointed to that too in your book that there were early reports from uh, Spanish priests in 1630 uh, that there, you know, uh, chronicles uh, during that uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, and so it turned out to be that that's kind of like was my hypothesis, you know, uh, you know, how did they evolve and was it indigenous? Was it uh, also some borrowing and mixture? And turned out that it, it ended up being both a, a, a mixture of the traditional uh, with some uh, elements uh, common to uh, secular systems in other parts of the world. Now, the, you know, you, you know, mentioned, mentioned uh, Jose. Uh, I'm, wondering I'm wondering if I'm if getting, getting uh, some, feedback. some feedback, unfortunately. unfortunately. Can, uh, can people hear that feedback? Okay, maybe that's gone now. Okay, so Jose, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of these uh, practices are based on agreements. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you were able to collect you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, long-standing uh, agreements and documentation. How did you go about, uh, you know, finding these documents? And you've captured them also in your book. And I'm hoping we can also flash to our audience maybe samples of what these look like because they are amazing. Yes. Well, that was part of the my field work, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned Walt Coward before. Well, it turns out that uh, I had just finished a book about the uh, irrigation systems here in New Mexico. And uh, in 1998, he attended a conference here in, in New Mexico about the uh, SECAS. And uh, he read my book and he said, well, what do you have next coming up? And I said, well, I'd like to go to Ilocos where you, you did your work and your article and Robert Sy and Ruth Yabes, your students were there too. And I told him, gosh, I'd like to go there too myself. So uh, at the time he was a, a senior director at the Ford Foundation, as you remember. And he, uh, I wrote a proposal uh, to the Ford Foundation and, and he funded it. So uh, that's how I got to Manila. And then after that to Ilocos, uh, Norte and Ilocos Sur. Uh, and so I collected these documents once I was out in the field. I interviewed, uh, you know, the, uh, the the irrigators, uh, the officers of the Sanqueras uh, in different places, uh, and then also at the uh, provincial, you know, irrigation office of the National Institute, the National uh, Irrigation Administration, the NIA, and so it was uh, uh, the the office there. Uh, Lelito Valdez was the uh, uh, officer in charge at the time, and uh, Alberto Cavanos uh, was a technician. And so uh, they took me around and I got to do these interviews. And before I left, I had asked them if uh, if I, I could uh, collect and, and study 
uh, the actual documents where they entered into these uh, water for land exchanges and how they ran their, their their administration and the rules that they had and how they enforced them and so forth. And so th that's how I uh, obtained the documents was through the uh, provincial irrigation office uh, in Loag City. No, it's, uh, it's really fascinating that uh, you've been able to capture you know, here, farmer-managed uh, irrigation organizations that have survived centuries. And this is where I think uh, maybe we have to ask you perhaps, uh, you know, for your thoughts on, you know, are these, are these institutions uniquely Ilocano? You know, because we find that, okay, you've got farmer-managed irrigation in many parts of the Philippines, but, you know, these long, uh, long-lasting and resilient institutions, I think we find only in Ilocos. So is there something about the environment, the culture, the people that enabled them to actually, uh, you know, preserve and, you know, maintain, sustain these organizations? Uh, yes, I, I I think so because that I heard that you know everywhere I went in Ilocos you know interviewing uh, the farmers themselves and they had a very deep uh, connection uh, to the land to the environment they had uh, a knowledge about the centuries old traditions that they were still following uh, they had a, a a deep appreciation of they kept referring to the ancestors. Uh, the ones that initially uh, carved out these uh, ditches, uh, these irrigation systems on the land and entered into these uh, negotiations with the landowners. Uh, many of those were wealthy landowners. And here you have uh, tenant farmers and, and others, you know, that previously did not have access to land. They successfully negotiated. So those were the ancestors. And so I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 spirit of uh, the Ilocano in terms of uh, reverence for the land, uh, a deep appreciation of the ancestors. Uh, I think that's what uh, makes a, a pretty uh, unique uh, characteristic of Ilocanos. They're also known for being very hardworking and industrious and getting things done. And I certainly found that to be the case. Uh, both by the field work and observations, and but also the documents. You know, they were pretty skillful. You know, mm -hmm. in negotiating with the landowners. You know, and uh, they they set about. You know, having sort of like a balance of, uh, well, uh, you know, we'll do this if you do that. There was a mutuality kind of spirit. You know, going on, and and the fact that uh, you know they developed these their own rules. Uh, they were not imposed. They were not created by the government uh, provincially or regionally or nationally. You know, these are actually autonomous uh, governance, you know, uh, irrigation systems. And I think that's one of the features that has uh, enabled them to perpetuate, uh, you know, into centuries later is that they have the uh, autonomy, you know, which does make them different. Going back to your question, how are they different from other farmer associations and farmer organizations in other parts of the Philippines. And from what I can tell, it's really their governance and their autonomy. They can uh, make decisions uh, pretty quickly and implement them, you know, without having to uh, go through a bureaucracy of, of a kind, you know. So that really fell into what I was interested in was, well, uh, as I call them, you know, people's institutions, people running uh, their own, uh, you know, institutions. No, the, uh you're absolutely right, uh, Jose. These, uh, you know, when when you actually probe and study the institutions further, and e and even the agreements, uh, there are many intricacies of these institutions. But uh, so so many of those intricacies actually enable them to survive and give them, you know, so many of the strengths that they have today. But one point I think you've also mentioned in your book is that they're facing today many challenges. And uh, some of these challenges are, of course, threatening their, their existence. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about 
what some of these challenges are and how you think they are confronting these risks and threats. Yeah. Well, well, surprisingly, uh, at least to me, you know, in, in your book, you laid out, you know, several challenges that were already underway. And then 10 years later, Ruth Yabitz in her dissertation, she also found many of those uh, challenges going on. And certainly I did in the year 2000. So like every 10 years, you know, but they, the, the problems and challenges multiply and they increase in intensity. And for example, I think uh, both you and Ruth, you know, com commented about, you know, overpopulation, you know, uh, threats to a conversion of agricultural land for urban purposes, you know, uh, and then uh, the uh, monitoring that's required, you know, of, of the system. So, uh, you know, youth uh, leaving uh, the countryside, so to speak, you know, and moving uh, to jobs and employment centers in, in the cities and so forth. And and so, uh, so many of those challenges still continue, but they, they have increased over time. There's more competition, there's more scarcity, for water there's more players you know out there and you know just to give you one example you know uh, the sanjeras uh, in terms of the national irrigation administration you know are are kept, are are identified as communal irrigation systems cis you know that acronym very well anyway so but there's 9000 communal irrigation systems in all of the Philippines, okay? And the Sanjeras, uh, the, the, the number varies as to how you count them and so forth, but they're not more than a thousand, you know? And uh, so uh, they really have to, you know, stand out, you know, to be able to get the attention uh, of the uh, National Irrigation Administration, you know? So, so th that was one of their challenges is how do they, uh, you know, uh, navigate, you know, through these mm -hmm. challenges. And of course, more recently, uh, and you, you, you all would know more about this than me, but it's certainly here in New Mexico, climate change is having a huge impact, you know, uh, of, and, on our system. And especially here, because the water here is from snowpack, you know, the mountains. This mm -hmm. is a high desert, you know, uh, climate here in Northern New Mexico. Uh, and uh, the uh, the water comes from the snowpack in the winter, and so when the snowpack is down, as has been evidenced in recent years, uh, and it's melting sooner, and the runoff comes out too early, and it ends, uh, you know, early for that reason. And so, uh, you know, that's those are the increased, uh, you know, uh, challenges that that are facing the Asequias here. Uh, but going back to Ilocos, yeah, the uh, 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 you know, uh, migration of youth, the uh, mm -hmm. population growth, uh, the urbanization of the countryside, those are, those are all uh, threats and continue. So it's, it's going to be interesting how the uh, you know, navigate into the yes. future. But I think they're, they're starting, they're doing a good job in my view. So Jose, uh, you mentioned, uh, of course, that uh, government uh, also has a role to play. Now, most of the, well, I think all of the Sangheras originated largely without government support and survived largely without government support. And we know that sometimes, you know, you can have uh, government support that can, you know, uh, nurture and uh, promote, you know, the, uh, the continued operation of these types of institutions, but you could also have government support that could undermine the, in a way, the operating procedures and uh, functioning of the organization. So my question to you is, uh, when you look at the future of the Sangheras, what kind of support do you think would be uh, perhaps appropriate coming from, for example, National Irrigation Administration, or perhaps even from the local government? You know, what kind of support would they need to, to help with some of these challenges going forward? I think from, from all levels of government, certainly the municipalities, certainly from the regional offices of the Irrigation Administration, and also from the national. But going back to the municipal level, that's where we see 
a lot of encouragement right now. I, you know, just a few months ago in June of this year, 2020, you know, uh, the municipal government at uh, PDIG uh, in Locos Norte, uh, the mayor has really gotten behind the Sanjeras in, 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 in that municipal district. And, uh, you know, they're supporting what they're doing. They're, they're, uh, you know, look at looking at them as uh, uh, protecting and preserving Ilocano history, Ilocano culture, and and especially the agriculture. They are working together to increase, uh, you know, uh, the market. You know, uh, in terms of uh, f economic feasibility of, of the sanqueras and the local the production of of local food uh, that uh, can come in very you know very important. You know, in terms of. Uh, when there's a natural disasters and the national food supply chain gets uh, uh, cut off or something, well, if if local people produce uh, enough, you know, then they have something, uh, you know, in the bank, so to speak. So uh, I think local government, uh, municipal government, and the provincial office, you know, at at Loak City, could do a lot. I think for the with the Sangheras in in a partnership. And that's what the mayor put out very strongly. He said, we're partners, you know, they're autonomous and we respect their independence, you know, and that's really the key and the strength of the Sanqueras is that they are autonomous and they, they hold together their, their solidarity, if you will. And so uh, I think the municipalities, and I do mention this in the book, that uh, perhaps uh, there could be some, uh, you know, uh, zoning and or other regulations, you know, ease, conservation easements and uh, to protect the Sanqueras from, uh, you know, being uh, urbanized uh, and value them as basically as cultural patrimony of Ilocos and cultural patrimony of the whole Philippines and enable them to uh, continue uh, the uh, ir irrigation that they have. Because as, as we know, you know, flood irrigation, because that's what the Zanqueras use, use. They're primarily earthen uh, canals, at least when I was there, as the same ones are here in New Mexico are earthen. And in both cases, the Ilocos and here in New Mexico, earthen uh, canals, you know, uh, re, uh, recharge the aquifer, you know, because the water seeps into the, the soil. Uh, and at the same time, uh, plants, shrubs, trees that grow along the banks uh, of the ditches or these uh, uh, canals, you know, uh, they preserve, uh, you know, plant and, and wildlife biodiversity at the same time. So basically, uh, if some uh, conservation easements uh, could be through, you know, enacted through the municipal uh, legislative process uh, to to support the Sanqueras, you know, that level. The, at the national level, I've alluded to it already that uh, it's difficult for the uh, Sanqueras to. Uh, to be able to uh, gather, you know, financial support uh, from the National Irrigation Administration because th 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 they have to apply, uh, th uh, you know, uh, in the same way that other farmer associations, you know, do throughout the, the country. And so, uh, you know, that makes it uh, pretty difficult, not just to the National Irrigation Administration, but also the, uh, the National Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. When Sacreras apply, they have to apply right alongside the other farmer associations throughout the country. And like I said, there's 9,000 communal irrigation systems, let alone the national systems and other, uh, you know, uh, associations. No, you, you've, you've uh, touched on a very good point. You know, uh, amazing lessons from the Sangheras in terms of sustainable resource management. Uh, and you also cited, you know, that they are a, a cultural treasure. You know, we already know that they uh, deserve, you know, a, a place as a Philippine cultural treasure. And I think we've talked about also the possibility of uh, submitting an application for recognition of the Sangheras as a World Heritage Site, you know, under UNESCO. Maybe you, you know, you're familiar with the other World Heritage Sites that are similar. Maybe you can give us an idea of how you know we could also uh, uh, pursue that opportunity. 
Uh, sure, uh, there are examples already. You know, we mentioned the uh, sequias of, uh, of Valencia, the ones that were in the Eleanor Ostrom's book alongside the Sanqueras. Those are the only two irrigation associations that she included. So she had something going there. And, you know, and gosh, that was 1990, you know, and here we are, you know, 30 years later. And, and, and but the, the Valencia sequias, they are uh designated as uh, in, uh cultural heritage intangible culture you know heritage uh for uh, both valencia and uh, the nearby uh area too of murcia they were uh, you know nominated at the same time as a joint application mm -hmm. and they are now world heritage sites and uh, and then right there in the Philippines, of course, you know, the rice terraces uh, have been World Heritage designations for quite some time. Uh, I think by the time I was in Ilocos, they already were uh, because uh, after Ilocos, I, I went by bus, uh, you know, it took me a whole day of travel uh, to get to Ifugao in the rice terraces there. And there they had their sign, you know, World Heritage, you know, so. Uh, I think it's uh, it's time maybe to move on with an application. You know, of course, it would have to be supported uh, by the government. You know, certainly the the municipalities where they exist, and also the regional offices uh, and the national offices. You know, so uh, you know th th that is a, a a good possibility. But meanwhile, I think there's a lot that can be done at the municipal level and the national level to uh, recognize them as important cultural patrimony. No, and, you, know, you know, Jose, Jose your, your, uh, your, book your book is probably, is probably sufficient, sufficient, you know, to help us with that application for that world, uh, world heritage recognition. So I think we will put this book to good use to pursue that application. But mm -hmm. you mentioned also that one support from uh, local government might also be to uh, get more people aware of what the Sangheras are doing, how they are able to manage their local environment sustainably, how they are able to, uh, in a way, balance the interests of landowners and farmers and even farmers who do not own land, you know, they're able to find win-win uh, situations out of a very difficult environment. And uh, this could also become, as you say, perhaps even something that could be of interest to, to tourists, right? I think we really need to see uh, so much more cultural richness in the Ilocos region. And this is really uh, one aspect of it, which really stands out. Uh, you know, as we confront also uh, many of the other global challenges, you know, you, we have today uh, climate change. We have also uh, degraded watersheds. We mm -hmm. have, you know, areas now that are suffering from, for example, you know, more flooding or, you know, other types of disasters. Again, you know, the Sangheras would have some useful lessons, you know, maybe you can tell us also your thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, there's certainly a lot to learn from that. Uh, and, uh, you know, this uh, caring for the land, you know, stewards of the land, you know, the respect of the wisdom of the elders, you know, they talked a lot about that when I visited their their, their farms, you know, uh, and, you know, just uh, bringing that forward, as you suggested, you know, that uh, not too many people may be aware of that, you know, and here it is in the backyard, you know, of, of uh, all the municipalities over there. But I think there's increasing uh, consciousness consciousness and increasing awareness that, hey, these, these are valuable institutions, you know, and you, like you mentioned, they were not created by government, you know, and, uh, you know, so that, that uh, ability to retain their autonomy and, you know, because of when there is change, you know, of technological, economic or environmental change, as we have seen that been going on, uh, they they have the capacity to adapt, and that's why I've admired and you know and studied all of these uh, you know what I call people's institutions because uh, th they are able to decide for themselves 
how to protect and preserve what they hold as valuable and this natural resource management that you're talking about clearly you know there's lessons to be learned there because as you know the sangheras share the water they share it amongst themselves through their atar holdings you know it's proportionate uh and they share it with the landowner uh and there's uh, they have principles of uh, distribution that respect, you know, uh, equity and principles of fairness, and everybody, you know, has has a turn. They rotate uh, taking of turns uh, off of the off of the uh, sangheira, you know, and so those are very valuable lessons that, in terms of applying them to other natural resources and in the environment, you know, air quality, you know, and air, water quality and uh, other kinds of transportation, the field that you're in now, uh, you know, as well, you know, how can people share uh, the resources and how can they uh, be maintained and kept sustainably uh, over time, you know, and that's one of the beauties of Sanjeras here and Asequios in New Mexico and Spain and, and in Mexico and other places, Peru, uh, that uh, these systems of irrigation are gravity driven. Okay, so they don't use fossil fuels. They're not pumping water. Uh, they're taking the running water right off of the river when there is water. Uh, and when there isn't, then they shut down the head gate. You know, mm -hmm. and so uh, unlike other more commercial agriculture ventures, uh, certainly here in the southwest, in western states of the United States, you know, a lot of it is commercial agriculture. You know, the only autonomous systems are the acequias of New Mexico and, and southern Colorado, our neighbor mm -hmm. to the north. You know, but all the other commercial agriculture, they, they use what's called center pivot irrigation, you know, and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, pumping, they, they deplete the aquifer and they run them 24 seven, you know, and Sanjeras do not run 24 uh, seven. They, they run only to, to irrigate the fields and then they turn it off. Then the next uh, farmer, you know, it's the next farmer's turn and the next one and all down the line until everybody gets a turn and it comes back around again. So it's a, a this idea of sharing Whatever you have, you share it, you know. And so in terms of high flow, everybody gets some. In terms of low flow, it's still shared. You know, that's the custom and the tradition of equity uh, in the system, you know. So those are great examples that, uh, you know, can be applied to other areas of, of resources, natural, natural resources. You know, how do we share? Uh, and then also this idea of self-government. You know, they proved, you know, that was part of your question earlier. What is it that attracted me or interested me about Sanjeras is that they uh, they proved that they can run themselves, you know, uh, and it's far less costly. And Mexico found this out, too. At one time, there was a centralization of irrigation in, in Mexico in, into irrigation districts, huge ones. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that they were not as efficient as what they replaced. They replaced a lot of these small scale irrigation systems. What in, in Mexico, colleagues that I have there uh, call it uh, pequeño riego, you know, small scale irrigation systems. And, and so now there's a movement to decentralize and go back in recognizing, you know, the, the autonomy that uh, that irrigation systems, you know, had before. So they definitely those are among the lessons that. Uh, uh, you know, the irrigators at a smaller scale and that control the, the flow and distribution of water, they're more likely to take care of it because, uh, you know, they, they want water to, you know, to be there sustainably and not pump it and use fossil fuels mm -hmm. and all these things in the process, you know. And the food supply system, too, I alluded to that earlier that, uh, yeah, it's uh, the acequias here are certainly... Uh, really working on this, you know, how to increase local food supply capacity uh, and so that, uh, you know, it reduces dependency, you know, the carbon footprint and all the transportation systems that it takes to in the national food supply systems and chains, you know, uh, you know, large grocery store chains and so forth. Well, the more that can be produced locally, you know, uh, that reduces that dependency. 
And uh, so th those are things that uh, I think, uh, you know, are important lessons, you know, from the Sanjeras. No, no, you're so right, Jose. Uh, when we look at really the, the biggest challenges today, right? It's a lot has to do with, you know, common pool resources that we have to manage, you know, as a, as a city, as a country, as a planet. And we uh, have only to look at, you know, how the Sangheras did it, right? There are many beautiful principles that come out of what you've written, but it's really uh, a tribute to the work of all those Sangheros over decades, over generations that evolved all these principles. It's really uh, uh, an amazing story. And I think, you know, you can almost imagine, right, when you're reading your book, as I did, you can almost imagine the, you know, the faces of the people who actually crafted these beautiful documents, you know, and the, the, the documents in, and the agreements, they're not only uh, written so beautifully by hand, you know, with uh, amazing calligraphy, you know, they must have found the best, you know, uh, the best writer in the whole community to, to write out these agreements. But what's contained in these agreements are uh, amazing, you know, uh, models of how you have, you know, these self-governing institutions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I think uh, we've had a lot of talking, but I think we want now to give uh, opportunities to our audience to ask some questions and maybe we'll we'll take some now i see some uh on my screen and uh okay here is one it says i'd like to ask if a local water uh if a local water code or water ordinance would complement the informal arrangements found among stakeholders in irrigation or distribution systems. Here in the Philippines, as asserted by scholars, water policy is driven by the state as primary actor and has a history of national policies overriding local informal arrangements. So, you know, again, you know, it's the, the state as big brother sort of maybe undermining some of the informal local arrangements. I mean, what's your observation either in the Philippines or in other places, so Jose? Yeah, that's definitely a, an issue. Um, certainly here in New Mexico, we have what's called the Office of the State Engineer. And the state engineer is in, responsible for administering all, all the public waters of New Mexico, the rivers and the streams and the creeks and so forth. And so uh, it's important to pass uh, legislation as happened here in New Mexico. Uh, the state engineer, uh, you know, was able to transfer water rights out of the uh, canal, out of the farmers, you know, system. Uh, and, uh, you know, allow selling of water. Water here in New Mexico and in most Western states here in the United States is, is a, a commodity. It's a piece of property and it can be bought and sold, unfortunately. It didn't used to be that way. Traditionally, it was not. And so what the Asekis did here, uh, once a number of these water transfers were going through and selling of water rights uh, to, to municipalities, to industry, to recreational users and so forth, uh, they went to the state legislature and uh, uh, they obtained uh, a new water law you know, that uh, allows the local autonomous institution, much like the Sanjeros over there, uh, to be the ones to decide whether to uh, uh, allow a transfer of water outside of the system or outside of the community. So, uh, so it is possible that new water codes or local water ordinances or, you know, municipal level or provincial level and, uh, you know, uh, th these can be changed, you know. It's a matter of organizing and mobilizing uh, resources and, you know, into a movement, really. And in fact, that's what it is here in New Mexico. Uh, the Osequia uh, governing bodies uh, and associations, you know, they have a New Mexico 
uh, association, uh, and they have regional and watershed level and local uh, Thicke associations, and they mobilize. They are a movement, you know, in, in getting these things done. They also, uh, it is 2003 is when they had, had this uh, new uh, legislation passed by the state of New Mexico, the legislators. Uh, and they also passed another one that allows uh, acequias to establish water banks, you know, to save water. That's If it's not being used uh, because of some of these changes, the same thing, you know, migration of young people uh, and so forth. And if a piece of uh, water is not being used on a piece of property, uh, it can be put into a water bank and then uh, allows the the administrators are called commissioners here, uh, you know, to then be able to uh, uh, put it to use, you know, somewhere else. So, so basically, yes, uh, to answer that question, uh, it is possible. I don't know uh, the feasibility of this, you know, in the context of Ilocos or even, of course, the Philippines, but uh, it has been done in other, other places, you know, around the world. Oh, perhaps a very good topic for future scholars, right? I mean, how, uh, what kinds of uh, rules or regulations can help to uh, promote and support rather than undermine, you know, some of the uh, work of these uh, irrigation organizations. Now we have uh, another question. Maybe we can flash it up again. Here it says, a lot of rural poor and ethnic groups face development aggression as a reality which could lead to displacement and environmental degradation in certain areas. Given this premise, one of the initiatives what communities do is to organize people's organizations that focus on protecting land or sea. What would be a way to strengthen these organizations aside from a policy advocacy approach? I, I would suggest uh, basically that start from where success has already been proven. And success has been proven in the Sangeras here and in other farmer managed irrigation systems around the world, uh, that success comes from the grassroots. Uh, you know, these are grassroots initiatives that uh, when people mobilized, they got together uh, and how to solve a common problem. In this case, you know, access to land in the case of uh, Ilocos. Uh, and it was grassroots. Uh, so I would think that uh, in terms of organizing uh, uh, people and so forth and uh, uh, it, prior to policy advocacy that w which would come later would be to start uh, you know grassroots you know kind of movements and uh, that takes an awful lot of work it's com good old-fashioned community organizing uh, it's good old-fashioned uh, farmer training programs farmer initiatives uh, technical assistance uh, legal assistance you know, from outside institutions and just uh, a coalition uh, of forces, you know, that could uh, be mobilized and put together. But it starts uh, with the foundational principles of uh, basically grassroots, you know, people themselves uh, recognizing and mobilizing, uh, you know, and the concept uh, that, that I use uh, in, uh, in the book and, and, and other things in, that I've written about this idea of mutualism, basically uh, getting people to see and understand that they are uh, mutually interdependent, you know, in terms of uh, a lot of their economy, their welfare, their health care, uh, and their, their natural resources that we're talking about today is this mutuality of interest. And, uh, you know, uh, if, 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 if everybody gets together and, uh, you know, they adopt these kind of principles and they mobilize, uh, that could be one way of uh, then having a stronger voice, if you will. You know, the Acequias of New Mexico that I keep mentioning, yeah, they meet at the state legislature every year, you know, the New Mexico Acequia Association and all their regional members and all their local affiliates throughout mm -hmm. the state. Uh, they uh, appear 
uh, during the legislative session to make their presence known. You know, they, they have a march. They use, uh, you know, shovels, you know, uh, Spanish call a pala. And so they have a pala march, they call it, basically a <laughs> shovel march. Yes. And they go around the state capitol building, you know, uh, with, with placards and signs saying, uh, el agua no se vende, el agua se defiende. Water is not for sale. Water is, def is to be defended, you know. And so they make their voices heard. You know, yes. the news people, the t television cameras, you know, from Albuquerque and so forth, you know, they're there, uh, you know, uh, recording all of this. And, and then they, uh, you know, uh, at noontime, they feed everybody. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> yeah. better mobilizing tool than having a, a free meal. In this case, they have tamales. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> like a fiesta so there, right? So, yeah, the legislators, yeah, they're in, they're in their offices in this one building already. You know, they, they meet for a month and sometimes two months. And so they come out and they, you know, they help themselves to the tamales. They talk to the irrigators and so forth and, and so forth. So, so that's, that, that's uh, you know, one way that, that, that I've seen that it's done here. Now, it's a very good point. So uh, two, two uh, points I want to highlight. One is that the profession of the community organizer is often undervalued, right? I think yes. we, we need to have more people working in that field and for that field to actually be supported financially and e economically. Second point is, you know, you mentioned that these, uh, these organizations in Mexico are able to uh, get together and have maybe a federation and they, that gives them also political power. Did you see any of that? in the Ilocos, because you have many of these Sangheras, but actually coming together as a single large federation with a stronger political voice, they could they could probably elect the next governor. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I met the governor of Ilocos Norte when I was there. Uh, Marcos, uh, you know, the son of Marcos was the governor there. Uh, and, uh, they were having an opening of the uh, museum there in Loag City, and uh, my gosh, the the journals that they had, they they had the Sangueras in the history of in this museum, you know, and it's still there. It's online. Some of the documents that the uh, museum uh, at Ilocos, you know, has these documents. So so anyway, uh, yeah, going back to 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 your your question about. Uh, you know, raising awareness and so forth and actually uh, establishing alliances. I, I guess I should mention that too. It's important. Uh, you know, the grassroots can do a lot, but certainly the alliances help. You know, environmentalists, you know, there's the environmental movement uh, everywhere, you know, uh, you know, the climate change issue and so forth. And all of these are, are por important partners and in, in alliance with the, they have natural, uh, you know, uh, uh, ties, I think, to the uh, uh, to the Sanjera movement, if we could start calling it that. So it's important to mobilize all of them. But in terms of uh, what was going on at, in Ilocos when I was there, uh, uh, the, 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 I guess the strongest force was the actually uh, the, uh, the case study that you had in your book, the Federación, you know, the Federation of uh, of, of Sanjeras, you know, I think you ha there were nine that were members mm -hmm. at the time that you did your field work and research, and they were still there when I went, yes. you know, all, 20 years later. Yeah, I met with the, Vintar. Yeah, the Vintar. president yeah. of, of the fe Federation of, of Sanjeras, you know, so you're right, when you band together like you've got nine, you multiply the families, you know, yes. uh, of each of those federations, you know, members of the federation. And pretty soon, uh, you know, there's political clout there. Politicians don't have to be told that directly. They will see that if they see uh, mobilization like federations and others. You know, that certainly is the case here. When these mm -hmm. uh, acequias uh, from New Mexico go to the state legislature and to the governor's office and uh, everybody else, you know, th th it's very well known that yes. uh, multiply each of these times the number of family members times the number of communities, you know, so forth. Well, those those are all uh, voters. Yeah, they and have a lot so of clout to this this grassroots yeah. uh, uh, movement. Uh, will, 
uh, you know, can can pave the way and unlock and make possible these new water ordinances and and the conservation easements that uh, protect us, uh, to protect San Jose and San Jose, because they recharge the aquifer. They, they provide these benefits to to the whole of society, you know, not just for themselves. So we have a final question, Jose. Uh, it says, how can we raise awareness about water justice among the wider community, particularly the youth? You know, how can we use awareness of the Sangheras? Gosh, I see that question is from Nadine. Uh, thank you, Nadine, for your question. We've been in touch for many months in getting this manuscript through the process. Nadine was one of the uh, people that, you know, got it done, got it through, and others, you know, on the team of uh, the uh, Taneo de Manila University Press. They've got a wonderful organization under Karina, you know, and all of the uh, technical and editors like Nadine and so forth. Well, anyway, Nadine, on your question, yes, definitely. Great last question. <laughs> Uh, the youth. Well, the way to, uh, I, I would suggest is that uh, definitely engage them, you know, uh, get them involved because this, the 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 uh, natural resources management and, and the uh, common pool resources that Robbie was talking about, that's the future. The youth will be in charge of all of those in the next 10 or more, you know, years or so. And so it's important to get them involved. Uh, again, the, an example here in New Mexico, uh, they, they have that. They have a, a, a youth organization called Sembrando Semillas, you know, and in Spanish it translates into English as uh, basically planting of seeds. And it refers to seeds out in the field, but the youth are the seeds. That's a double meaning in that Sembrando Semillas. They're preparing youth here you know, 14-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and so forth, you know, uh, to get involved in Aseca agriculture. And over there, it would be Sanjera agriculture. Get the youth involved. Get them out there during the cleaning of, of, of the canal. You know, get them involved, uh, you know, in, in, in other uh, rituals, and with which there are many in, in, in Locos, you know. Uh, you know, get them interested and have them talk to the elders you know, and uh, they can learn, you know, this, the wisdom of, of the uh, elders, you know, and that's part of the Sangheda tradition. That's why they pay uh, reverence, you know, to the ancestors, because that's where the, the wisdom came handed down from one generation to the next and to the next. So the youth, it's important for them to then pick it up, you know, and, and continue it into another, another generation, because they are the stewards of the planet and its resources, you know, uh, into the future. And schools would be an excellent mechanism, you know, uh, see if curriculum can be developed, you know, around uh, the Sanjera and the Sanjera landscape and uh, the ecological benefits of uh, Sanjera agriculture and so forth. Uh, have students interview the elders, you know, to, as an oral history assignment from the teacher. And you know, document those things. Go out and and uh, do uh, some artwork with the Sangheda. Beautiful landscapes, Robbie, as you you know yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know that's part mm -hmm. of the Sangheda legacy is that they have created this mosaic. You know, this green belt of uh, you know uh, farming and agriculture, and th there's a lot that could be captured there uh, through oral history interviews and. Uh, documentation uh, and other kinds of assignments that teachers can do in the school. So there it goes back to local government or municipalities. Uh, I'm not sure who how schools are administered in the locus, but who are, the school administration basically they they should they can get involved too and they bring the the youth along. But it's important for the youth, you know, to. Uh, continue this, uh, what Robbie, you were alluding to earlier, this uh, special sort of reverence that uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I the local farmers, you know, have uh, for the environment and the land, the history, the culture. And uh, that's the, the one way to pass it down is, is through the youth of today, recognizing that they're the ones that are going to have to, uh, you know, protect and preserve the, the resources of uh, locally as well as globally. 
Well, thanks, well, thanks so, much, so much, Jose, for, for that, that powerful, powerful message. message and, and congratulations, congratulations to Ateneo University Press and to Jose for this amazing masterpiece. So I want to uh, turn over now back to our Ateneo University Press colleagues. Uh, you know, this was a great session, Jose. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, um, what a truly meaningful conversation. Um, thank you, Dr. Rivera and Dr. C for introducing the San Jeras of Ilocos and other sustainable agricultural communities from around the world um, to us today. We have, uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, and like what was mentioned earlier, um, in today's um, global water crisis, the Sanhera legacy offers important lessons about collective action, water sharing, and resource sustainability. Thank you also to everyone who sent their comments and questions and for taking part in launching the print and ebook versions of the Sanjeras of Ilocos, Cooperative Irrigation Societies of the Philippines by Jose Rivera. You shouldn't miss such an informative read. Grab a copy today at Manila International Online Book Fair. Enjoy Ateneo, Ateneo Press's discounts and special bundle promos and shop for books at www.manilabookfair.com. There are more online talks organized by Ateneo University Press for MIBF Online. Check out the lineup of events by visiting our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Ateneo Press. We hope we have given sufficient insight into this exemplary model of sustainable agriculture. Thank you to Mr. Robert C. for joining us today. And of course, to author and community irrigation scholar, Jose Rivera, for putting together this monograph. We hope that by publishing this book, we encourage more conversations and discussions and hopefully lead to actions that will strengthen the adoptive capacity of Sanjeras. Once again, I am Almira Mandurio of Ateneo University Press. Stay safe and have a great week ahead. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.